we have a very special guest tonight. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, he comes to us from North Aurora. We've spared no expense to get this guy here tonight. Literally, no expense. <laughs> it, uh, our, uh, <laughs> our esteemed president, Lanny Hockhauser, is going to be tying a really awesome uh, pattern for us tonight. Yeah, you're doing two versions, Lanny? Two and, versions of the black stone fly. Okay, so with no Just further ado, ado, Mr. Hockhauser. Thanks. I'll, I'll turn my uh, mic off now. Okay. I thought I'd go through what I'm going to use here with, as tools. My trusty bobbin. It's a little stone flow. I'm using 8-0 black. You can use 6-0 and this doesn't matter. Got scissors. My whip finisher that I use sometimes. A bodkin and a nice little bead tweezers. And that is pretty much it. The kinds of materials I'll use will be black and antron yarn for one of the uh, versions of the body. I, I'm going to use black ice stub for one version of the thorax. And then for the other, I'll show you my favorite little dubbing, this stuff from uh, Doug Swisher out in Montana. It's fine black dubbing, and it's got very fine rubber legs in it, like for a number 22 or 24 fly. I mean, they're really fine. But when you put them in a dubbing loop and, and spin them for a thorax or a head, they just are buggy as can be. So uh, I, I really like them. Now for purposes of demonstration, although we said size 12, I'm gonna use just a straight size 10 hook. So I thought it'd show up better in the video. And uh, with that, I'll take this fly out of the, out of the vise and just start with what we're going to tie. And I've taken my hook and put, put the bead on it first. And uh, mount it up in the vise. And as I do this, I'll be working to try to keep all this stuff in focus for you. This, this microscope camera we have is very cool, but the focus is very unforgiving. Very sharp right now, Lanny. Is it? Yeah, very okay, sharp. I'm going to uh, pin this thing so it shows. Okay, yeah, that looks pretty good. Now, I forgot to... Uh, put one material up and that's these uh, goose biots that I'm going to use for the tail and for the antenna. And this is unusual the way I tie it in that I move the uh, bead back and I'm gonna put some thread right behind the eye of the hook and put a tiny thread bump. It doesn't have to be big just a little bit that will help you spread the antenna. Quiet. I can, I can see better watching my computer screen than I can. Let's see if this works. Now, grab any two biots and uh, you can pull them off or cut them off because the butt ends aren't critical in this like when you're uh, winding a uh, here, come on when you're winding a, a body on a dry fly for instance I'm just going to cut these things off
then of course you have the problem of manipulating these little guys and splitting so you can put them on Can I drop them? Oh, there they are. I'm going to tie on one at a time. And when you tie these guys in, use as few wraps as possible to secure them. And because the bead is going to have to slide back up over the butt ends. So I'm just going to put that out there. And put a loose wrap on him and see if he won't stay right there. You see, just with that little bump, it makes that flare out just nicely. I've got that guy flared. I'm going to try this guy. And the trick is to do this without destroying that little flare as you as you tighten them up. Okay. Try this again. That's better. without, like I just did there. Now I'm going to try to see if I can give those guys a little twist and hopefully they'll sit just like that. When I, and can you tilt the fly towards us so we can see how they're splayed? Yeah, thanks. When you're playing with this bead like this, it's really easy to mess this up, and uh, I'm tempted to put a drop of epoxy on this, or I mean, uh, instant glue, because uh, as you push this bead back up here, you might disturb their, their positions. So I'm going to try to hold them and shove that bead up at the same time. And as you see, I didn't quite get it right because there's more room there than I wanted. Let me try to tie the ends of that down. Well, I'll just whip this off the time being and leave that like it because I was satisfied with the way those those feelers went out there. The next shot hopefully will be uh, be better. And you're going to retie your thread because you're going to go to the back and put on those tails. And it's the same issue as, as in the front. You want them to splay out a little bit. And uh, the best way to do that is with a little thread bump. And you'll see I, I put just a, a tiny little bump on it right there. Not, not much of anything. And that's, I think, all you need to make these things spread out. Boy, that light on this microscope camera we're using to do this is really nice. We ought to have a way somehow to show you guys how we use this setup. You can do it from your laptop, Lanny, if you just manipulate your yeah. screen a little bit. We could see it because I almost saw the, 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 the cord. I'd be interested to see it myself. Okay. What I've done to set this thing up is, uh, let me go back. And this is really an experiment because I've got the uh, 
microscope light here and my vice here. So the light's in between me and the vice, and it's it's not lit up because uh, it's interesting. When I go back and select the digital microscope, then the light comes on, and you can see it on the fly. But uh, this is really a work in progress about how to set this up to broadcast one of these ties and and make them presentable. Okay, now I've got my I've got two more little whoops, two more little biots cut, and I'm going to do the same thing with them in the back. Now some some folks tie these things on uh, two at a time and uh, I don't like to do it that way. I think I have more control this way. Get a little splay there. And too many wraps will mess that splay up. Nice. Untwist my thread, it'll work a little better. Oh. Well, you have your thread wrapped around the hook shank too, or the bar hook. Yeah. That'll do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I can't see it. Well, Davy Watton says more wraps can't fix it, so just yeah, unwrap and do it again. Where is it? There they are. And, and this is the toughest part of the of the tie. Getting these two little things on. And my hands are real shaky. I've had an interesting day, so. Now I'm going to grab this antron and try to make the, the body. And I'm going to use, but I think I have six inches of it here. And what I do, and you don't necessarily have to do it on this one, <clears throat> but I take a piece of wood like this and uh, I have a new single edge razor blade and this works with with any yarn you're doing and especially when you get into the smaller flies if you put it on the board you take the blade and scrape maybe the last half inch of the yarn a couple of times and then move up the next half inch and scrape the whole yarn and then another half inch in the whole yarn eventually you can give that a little taper for the tie end point. With this, I'm going to take it and look at the size of my fly. Uh, let me get back to the, the microscope. And decide. I've now twisted it. 
and I'm wondering if that is going to be right for the body or do I take one of these uh, out? And I think I'll take a, a couple of these things out and that will taper this fine. So here I have this thread. I'm just gonna lay in and take it back to the tie-in point with the, to, of, the, uh, of the tail without disturbing how the tail is situated. Now, there it is. I'm just gonna take a uh, hackle plier and put it on this thing and spin it a little bit. I can't find my hackle plier. I have a hackle plier that has a little rod that goes into the bottom of the hackle plier here and, and stretches out. And you can use that to spin things in the hackle plier there. Now I've got this tight. I'm just going to, to make some uh, touching loops and see how that does for the body. And even though this is the, the body part, I'm going to take it all the way up to the bead because uh, that'll make it easier to wrap the head. There I go. I'm going to try to cut this off. And I'm, I'm still a rookie. I always turn the vise straight up to cut something off so that I don't cut the tying thread. Now for the ice dubbing, I'm going to make a loop, a dubbing loop. Situated back there. And everybody knows how, <clears throat> how difficult ice dubbing can be sometimes. And that's why I'm using a, a loop. And what I'm going to do, I find my loop again and untwist it. Oh man, I'm really. Oh, there it is. I'm going to dub this around one side. Of the dubbing loop. And just put on maybe a at most a two inch noodle and then I'm going to pull this thing together okay uh, here it is And I'm going to spin this up. So what this does is lock down that uh, that ice dub, so it's not going to uh, come out. I always have trouble with ice dub on a single. You still see that? Okay. This will really start to fluoresce on here when you get it on. Let 
There you go. A uh, nice little shiny head. You can whip finish this before you put the uh, the little coating on the uh, top of the thorax. And let's see. Atlanta. Yeah. You need to whip finish twice on that bug, once ahead of the bead and once behind the bead then? Oh, yeah. What what I do is when I tie down the, uh, when I tie down these little antenna up front here, yeah. I wrap that spot too big because I'm so far away from the vise, that's my excuse, that I couldn't slide the bead back up over it, but I, I, I whip finish it right up here, just one or two whips. So you can push the bead over the top of it. The bead should really be sitting right up here. Well, this is a design against... modification. What? This is a design modification. It is. <laughs> but here I have the, the thorax, and I can tease it down a little bit. Try to get it looking a little more leggy. This is one of those things that doesn't work sometimes, so I'm using it as a, a dubbing uh, brush. It's what one of those uh, little round uh, diamond files that is supposed to let you open up uh, a bead when the bead hole is too small. I haven't had a lot of luck with it, but. There don't ever, is. don't ever tell me I got a lot of stuff, Lanny. Don't I will ever tell me that. <laughs> I will. Well, I might, but you know, I'll get it right back. I'm going to take uh, UV clear. Where is there? Thick finish, and I'm going to try to uh, see if I can't get some on the top of this. Come on. There we go. And when you first put it on, it can look pretty bad, but you just let it sit there and work its way down the side of the fly and you can help it a little bit with your dubbing needle. I see it's too far to my side, so I just move it over a bit. Hopefully it'll settle a bit more without getting the threads in it. What happened here? There it is. And Boy, this microscope is just unforgiving. You can see stuff here. <laughs> you can't see yourself when you're tying. Yeah, it it's really makes amazing. you question your skills. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I well, can I'm trying to that. <laughs> well, there we go. Now this is, you know, the level of complexity of this fly is really still in the guide fly sort of category. But, uh, you know, you got some little picked out legs and the, the narrow body. I think it's good. Hey, Lanny, is that a winter fly or a, or a spring fly? When would you use that? that? That can be, well, it can be a spring fly. Whenever you notice the stone flies or when, 
where this really works well is say in uh, in on the Barothi strip when you go up to the Pier Marquette and the the uh, steel header on the, on the reds if you put this on and I didn't do it this time but heavily weighted I mean use it instead of a plain bead use a tungsten bead and almost cover the body with uh, kind of lead or lead substitute wraps. Then put this on as a lead fly and maybe 18 inches up from it, put on your favorite uh, egg pattern, whether it's, uh, you know, the clown egg, that big ugly one or some small egg or a veiled egg, you know, pair, whatever you do. And, uh, if the PM is not terrible, you can get this down low enough to feel it on the bottom. If you can't feel it hitting the bottom, you're not you're not getting it low enough fast enough. But when I was fishing up there with with Gene, I got as many hits on this as I did on the the uh, the clown egg. So I think it's pretty good. Of course, when they're on the reds, I think it's irritating them more than anything else, but we we're trying to get on top of the hens. So by the time it got down, it was in front of the, the bucks stacking up behind the hens so you can get it through there and not get the hens off the reds. But that was fun. Now let, let me try it another way. Hey, Lanny? Yes. Um, if you put the bead on the wrong way, you can actually get it closer up. Uh, I'm, I'm putting the bead on small hole first. Yeah, but if you put the large hole on first. Yeah, it would fit better. It'll fit better up into, uh, I do it backwards. I put the bead on backwards. I and, just did. And it actually fit up better into uh, the front. Yeah, that would probably keep me out of trouble there. Why I, the angle of this is funny. I, there. Well, I like the way this thing looks, this microscope camera. I'm just going to have to get used to tying on it <laughs> with a camera in between me and the vise. I want to keep that. Yeah, I thought that might be a bit challenging. Yes, you said that, and you were right, Mark. I asked Denton, and he said, well, maybe he's got long arms. It's not so much the long arms as getting your bifocals to work at that distance. That can be a problem. Because when I'm tying, I'm not looking at the – I should be looking at the computer and ignoring the, the fly in the vice entirely. Yes. But then that's like tying in Braille, you know. Yeah, you can use it really <laughs> fast. We'll Very see nice. how this works. Put this guy on again up here. Well, I'll be interested to see how mine goes because I need light to see. Yeah. I know. I and can't tie too. in the dark. There you go. You got you nailed that one. Yep. And I'm not going to mess with it. I would leave it. I would glue it. Too many right wraps. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to try to put a drop of glue on it when I get the next one on there. The problem here, I think, is I've got light coming from too many directions. What, just two wraps holds that really tight. Holy cow.
Okay, let's go at this again with Bob Charles' excellent recommendation. And see how Actually, it's a great recommendation. That was a whole lot easier. I thought that was Glenn. Was that Glenn? Was that you, Glenn, or Bob Charles? No, that was me, Bob Charles. Okay, sorry, Bob. Sorry, Glenn. <laughs> That's all right. You know, I just did it wrong, and it turned out right. Sorry, everybody. That way. Okay, now I've got them on again. Whip finished it, cut the thread off. And I have my uh, Loctite super glue. Let's see if I can get a small. Oh, man. You see that one? Yeah. There we go. Paper towel. Yep, that came out fast. Move my finger to it. Push this up. Move my fingers together. Now, what did I do? I pushed something. I think I pushed this. There we go. Whoops. Yeah. See, that is the problem, Mark. I knocked the microscope off of the stand and well, you know, Halloween's just the end of the week, so this could be like a Halloween movie. Well, it's okay. It's all here's, good. Here's the fun trying to focus this darn thing. There you go. Oh. That's pretty good. So I think that worked pretty good that way. See if you can get the focus a, a pinch better. It's just a, just it's just barely okay. off. Yeah, and, and the real issue is the focus is so fine with the depth of field this thing has that you'll notice that look at the hook eye. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. There you go. There the you go. Perfect. That's good. Yeah. But the uh, the hook eye and the bead are just fat, different enough thicknesses that uh, you know it would be interesting the hydrodynamics with the bead that direction. I was just thinking it's, about it's that. like a cup now, you know. This may be a whole new thing, you guys. Start. Hey, it's a popper. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm going to cut off a couple of buyouts for the back end. Yeah, where did that other little bugger go? There he is. Uh, 
lost them. Yeah, I think I bit off more than I could handle today. <laughs> Looking great, Laney. Yeah, does look good. My daughter got moved, so that's one good thing. I got to spend my, the day with my three-month-old grandson. That was fun. But you did a good job, Lenny. Don't worry about Poops it. Out, poops out an old guy. Okay. I am going to uh, twist the body again with the antron, but then I'm going to use the uh, This. I'm going to use the this Doug Swisher stuff for the thorax. No. This is so much easier with this little. Ordinarily, I'd be using the rotary function and it would go just a little bit better, but this works. So that was pretty easy. It was just to put the, the body on the whole length right up to the beat. What did I do with that tail? No, I twisted under. There it is. So I was able to get it actually twisted right. It's hard to, to see that thing. There it is. And here I go again. The dubbing loop. And this time I'm going. <laughs> Thank you, Doc, for these heavy tweezers. Slip these in here to keep it open. and try to use this Doug Swisher stuff. I'll hold it out and see if, can you see the little rubber ones in there now? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, and this particular dubbing just goes everywhere when you're sticking it in the loop. A little bit more. Make it nice and buggy. Let's 
Stuff is fun to manipulate. And I just lost it. Nothing loop broke. No wonder I lost it. Oh, well. That hasn't happened to me in a long time. Right. I won't let go of the loop. Try not to have it cut itself in there. There. Is that up? There it is. Go and see how this I'm going to just rub it a little bit with that. Uh... It's holding up pretty well. And now, if you don't mind, I think I'll use the, the rotary function to uh, put that on because it's wanting to go everywhere here. There we go. Now that should be big and bushy. Now I just have to get it controlled and trim down a little bit. Call that the Phyllis Diller fly, huh? Yeah, it really yeah. is. <laughs> what do they call that? Is that is that? Do they call that wiggle dub or something like that? Well, is it's, that what it's you called, know, Doug or? Swisher calls it his Generation X. Montana fly, packaged in Thailand, of course. And this is plenty buggy, but in order to make the thorax on top, I'm gonna to take my scissors along the top and just snip some of this top stuff off. Boy, is that thick. That really does look buggy though. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And I'm gonna whip finish it right now before I put on that. Uh... You could, you could uh, buggy up the bottom too. What I'm trying to do is, uh, it's hard to see the contrast there, but make it flat enough on top that I'll like the way this uh, UV thick fits on the fly. So I'm gonna take the UV thick again. And I think if you don't, if you don't trim back some of these really buggy looking flies that maybe you spin to the loop, the, the, some of the fuzzies stick straight up and capture the, uh, the cement 
or the UV resin, and they just don't they don't want to uh, go back down. Okay, where is my towel here? Starting to subside a little bit. They really, when they say thick, they mean it, but it mm -hmm. it settles pretty nice. If you're patient, just let it settle before you use the light on it. See how that looks like after I light it up. Yeah, that, I mean, you can trim off some of the legs that are sticking down or going out the front, but it will certainly be a buggy fly. And I, I imagine some of you can find a use for something like that as you look at how it goes here. So that, that is uh, my pattern and it just works like a, a champ, whether you're in the Driftless uh, or up on the Pier Marquette. I think this imitates any number of, you know, dark colored uh, nymphs. So it, it, it has worked for me. I've tied it as small as 16, you know, a little, little tiny one. And, Works just great. 